Hello folks and goats, welcome to the Command Valley for another Command Valley gameplay video. This one is a little bit different. We have let our patrons decide what kind of commander deck that we will be playing today. Our patrons voted for Aristocrats to be the next gameplay video, so enjoy this Aristocrats gameplay decided by our patrons. A big shout out to GameGrid for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for any of these cards or any of these decks, we will include a full deck list for each of the decks that we are playing that you can take to Game Group's website and order those cards directly to your house. Helps us out, and it helps you out by getting the cards that you want and playing these super fun decks. Another reminder that this episode is specifically brought to you by our patrons. If you would like to participate in our next Patreon Decided gameplay video and get access to tons of exclusive perks and extra content, then head on over to patreon.com slash commandvalley and consider joining today. Since this is not a Duel of the Peaks episode, there will be no point challenges, but just a fun Aristocrats game where all four of us will be playing an Aristocrats deck from different colors and see who comes out on top. I will be introducing the decks, the hands, and then Landon will be doing the play-by-play. -play. For this game, Landon decided to bring his very own Korovold, the Fakers King Aristocrats deck. The goal of his deck is to, number one, set up sack outlets and token fodder. Number two, get Korvold out. Number three, find and loop Avenger of Zendikar and recur it repeatedly until everyone is dead. His opening hand was Mayhem Devil, Spring Bloom Druid, Viserysir, Field of the Dead, Overgrown Tomb, Stomping Ground, and a Forest. Griffin decided to bring the new Cardor Doom Scourge Aristocrats deck from Kaldheim. The goal of his deck is to number one, create lots of tokens, number two, to manipulate combat, and number three, sacrifice creatures during combat for extra aristocrats triggers. His opening hand was Empty the Warrens, Krenko Tin Street Kingpin, Read the Bones, Tilanali's Summoner, Knight's Whisper, Charcoal Diamond, and a Swamp. Peter is bringing Zyrus the Writhing Storm, but built it in an aristocrat style way, so this will be one of those first teamer aristocrats build that you might have seen. For his deck, the first thing he wants to do is to make other people draw cards. Number two, get a ton of snakes off of Zyrus. And number three, sacrifice those snakes for value. His opening hand was Minds Aglow, Teferi's Puzzle Box, Kessig Wolf Run, Scavenger Grounds, Desolate Lighthouse, Gaia Reach Sanitarium, and a Mountain. Lastly, we have Caleb, who has brought his Jarena Kudro Aristocrat style deck. His deck will number one, be attempting to create tokens to sacrifice for value. Number two, damage and drain with enter the battlefield and leave the battlefield effects. And number three, make infinite tokens with combos if possible. His opening hand was Damnation, Ashnod's Altar, Rakdo Signet, Cruel Celebrant, Bloodcrift, Clifftop Retreat, and Command Tower. And with that, I'll pass off to Landon to begin our turn one. Landon wins the die roll and will be going first. He starts by shocking in an Overgrown Tomb, and he taps that Overgrown Tomb to cast a Viscera Seer, and with nothing else, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn, and then passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws and plays down a Mountain, and with nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb draws and plays down a Tapped Blood Crypt, and with nothing left to do, passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and he shocks in a Stomping Ground, and then taps both of his lands to cast a Nature's Lore, finding a basic force and putting it onto the battlefield. He then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down another Swamp as his land for turn, and taps both of his Swamps to cast a Charcoal Diamond, which will enter the battlefield tapped. He then passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws, and having an unfortunate stroke of luck with his lands, has to play down a Gruel Turf, and when that enters the battlefield, he has to bounce a Mountain to his hand. He has to discard in his end step, and he discards the Desolate Lighthouse. Caleb untaps and draws, and plays down a Clifftop Retreat, and taps both of his lands to play a Rakdo Signet, and then he passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a forest and taps two of his mana to play a Talisman of Resilience. He then taps three more of his mana to cast a Mayhem Devil. With Mayhem Devil entering the battlefield as our first Aristocrat synergy piece, you'll see a lot of these throughout the game. Every single player is playing your Aristocrat deck, so the most important part of their decks is these death triggers that allow them to deal damage or to drain their opponents or other sorts of value. And Mayhem Devil being one of the top Aristocrats dogs in this game because he cares about whenever a player sacrifices a permanent. So that means whenever Lennon's opponents will sacrifice things, because they will, because they're playing Aristocrats, Lennon will also get triggers. Landon then enters combat and swings the Viscera Seer at Caleb for a total of 1 damage, and with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, and taps 2 of his lands to cast a Knight's Whisper, taking 2 life and drawing 2 cards. 
And having to discard to hand size in his end step, he puts an empty the Warrens into the graveyard. Peter untaps and draws and plays on a Gaia Reach Sanitarium as his land for turn and taps two mana for a Lightning Greaves. With nothing left, he passes to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a Command Tower as his land for turn. He also pays two mana to cast a Knight's Whisper of his own, losing two life and drawing two cards. He then taps the rest of his mana for an Arcane Signet, and then he ships the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and then draws and then drops down a Field of the Dead. Field of the Dead, one of the most spectacular cards that honestly, when it first came out, I didn't expect it to end up in so many decks. But with that advantage of getting triggers off of any land that enters the battlefield, giving you a zombie once you have seven or more different lands, this is also one of those key pieces in an Aristocrat's deck and will serve Landon very well throughout the game. Landon then pays three mana to cast a Springbloom Druid, and on the end of the battlefield trigger, he sacrifices a forest to tutor up a snow-covered forest and a mountain, putting them both into play tapped. This will trigger the Mayhem Devil, seeing the Springbloom Druid sacrificing one of his lands, and Landon deals one damage to Griffin. He then pays three more mana to cast a Farhaven Elf, tutoring up a swamp, putting it into play tapped, and that will trigger his Field of the Dead, having seven different lands with different names, so Field of the Dead will make him a 2-2 zombie token. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, and he pays 3 mana to cast a Read the Bones, losing 2 more life, scrying 2, and drawing 2 cards. He plays down a Foreboding Ruins as his land for turn, revealing a Swamp from his hand to let it come into play untapped, and then he has to pass the turn, discarding a Goblin Offensive to hand size. Peter goes to his turn and untaps and draws and plays down a Scavenging Grounds as his land for turn and then taps 4 mana for a Teferi's Puzzle Box. Teferi's Puzzle Box, making every single player dump their hand and draw that many cards on each of their turns, is particularly powerful for Peter. When he casts Zyrus, this will make it that every card that they draw off of Teferi's Puzzle Box will give him a 1-1 snake. So potentially, cast Zyrus, and then the next turn, untap with 15 plus snakes. Feeling pretty confident with his Teferi's puzzle box, Peter passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws, and the puzzle box triggers after Caleb has drawn his card. He has to put six cards on the bottom of his library and then draw a fresh new six cards. He plays an Ancient Tomb as his land for turn. He taps the Ancient Tomb, taking two damage and two more mana to cast a Timna the Weaver with one mana floating. He will use the rest of his mana, including the colorless floating mana, to cast his commander, Jarena Kudro, making a 1-1 human soldier creature token when she enters the battlefield. He then passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and due to the Teferi's puzzle box, is going to have to put the two cards in his hand on the bottom of his library and then draw two cards from the puzzle box's ability. Landon taps five of his mana to cast his commander, Corvold Fakers King. When it enters the battlefield, he has to sacrifice a permanent, and he elects to sacrifice his 2-2 zombie, which will trigger Corvold, letting him draw a card, and the dragon will get a plus one plus one counter. He then plays a forest as his land for turn, triggering the field of the dead, giving him another 2-2 zombie. He then pays one more mana to cast a Elves of Deep Shadow, and then sacrifices a zombie to Viscera Seer to scry the top card of his library. This will trigger both Corvold and the Mayhem Devil. Mayhem Devil is going to do one damage to Caleb's lone human soldier token, killing it, and Corvold is going to draw land in a card and put a plus one plus one counter on itself. He then heads to combat and swings the Mayhem Devil at Griffin for three, who does not block and takes the damage. With nothing left, Landon ships the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and bottoms eight cards and draws a fresh new eight cards from the puzzle box. Griffin pays 2 mana for a young Pyromancer and unfortunately has to pass the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and the puzzle box triggers and he puts 6 cards on the bottom of his library and draws a fresh new 6 cards. He shocks in his steam vents taking 2 damage and then taps out to cast his commander Zyrus the Writhing Storm. He puts the Greaves onto Zyrus and heads to combat and swings Zyrus at Caleb for a total of 3 damage. Caleb takes it and this will trigger Zyrus, resulting in Peter and Caleb both drawing three cards. When Caleb draws the cards, Zyrus is going to make Peter three 1-1 one -one snake tokens. Peter passes and discarding a heroic intervention to his hand size. Caleb is going to untap and draw and bottom nine cards from the puzzle box and draw fresh new nine cards. This will trigger Zyrus and Peter will make nine more snakes. So he has a total of 12 snakes at this point. And Caleb, with a fresh new hand of 9 cards, plays down an isolated chapel as his land for 2, and then pays 2 mana for a Bitter Blossom, 2 more mana for a Dark Confident, and 4 mana for a Keeper of the Accord. 
With nothing left, he passes the turn. We are now heading into turn number six for the game, and this is the beginning of Landon's turn. And just a quick editor's note from Peter as he was editing this video, and as we are narrating this video, the next two to three turns are an absolute mess. A lot of crap happens, there are so many triggers. Uh, Landon hit his goal of getting Avenger of Zendikar, and it turned out to be a mess for everybody. So this is, seriously, it's going to be kind of a mess and a little sketchy, so just bear with me. I'm going to do my very best to power through this. The lesson that we have all learned from this and the future turns is, if you're in a playgroup and you guys decide to play a four-player game where everybody's playing aristocrats, just don't. Landon untaps and he draws, bottoming three cards from his hand to the puzzle box and drawing three more, which will give three snakes to Peter. He plays down a Temple of Malady as his land for turn, scrying a card to the bottom, and this will trigger his Fill of the Dead, giving him a 2-2 zombie. He then plays a Carrion Feeder and then taps three mana for a Haro. Now, there are going to be several triggers on the stack with the Haro. There's going to be a Corfield trigger and a Mayhem Devil trigger, and two more Fill of the Dead triggers when the lands enter the battlefield. Landon resolves the Corvold trigger first before he tutors, drawing a card, and he sacrifices a forest to the Haro. Landon then finds a mountain and a swamp and puts them into play, giving him two more zombies. He then sacrifices the zombies to the Carrion Feeder, giving three more Corvold triggers and three more Mayhem Devil triggers. He points three damage at Peter. Landon draws three cards, giving Peter three more snakes from the Corvold triggers. He then pays three mana for a Wood Elves, finding a forest and putting it into play untapped, giving him another zombie. He then pays three more mana for Yavi Maya Druid, finding yet again another forest putting into play, tapped, making another 2-2 zombie. He will then sacrifice these zombies to the Carrion Feeder, drawing two more cards, dealing two more damage to Peter's face, and making two more snakes for Peter. He then taps one more mana for a Soul Ring, and taps two mana to cast a Regrowth returning Haro from his graveyard to his hand. Oh man. He then recasts Haro, sacrificing a mountain. This will trigger Corvold and he draws a card, and this will give Peter another snake. When the two lands enter the battlefield, he makes two more zombies from the Field of the Dead, which he subsequently sacrifices to the Carrion Feeder, again, triggering Corvold two more times and Mayhem Devil and Zyrus two more times each. He then sacrifices his Wood Elves, Yavimaya Druid, Springbloom Druid, Farhaven Elf, all to Carrion Feeder, triggering Corvold four more times. Mayhem Devil and Zyrus also will trigger four more times apiece. At this point, Peter has a total of 28 snakes and Corvold is a massive 18-18. Landon then heads to combat, swinging the massive dragon at Peter, and when Corvold attacks, he has to sacrifice a permanent and he sacrifices the Talisman of Resilience. In response to this, he also sacrifices the Elves of Deep Shadow and the Carrion Feeder to his Viscerous Seer, getting some more Scrides and some more Corvold triggers, and the Mayhem Devil and Exiris will trigger three more times. Landon is desperately trying to get his Corvold up to 21 power to kill Peter right then and there. Instead of pointing all of the damage from the Mayhem Devil at Peter, he instead deals some damage to Caleb's board, killing the Timna to clear his board out a little bit. However, before damage is dealt to Peter, Griffin intervenes and casts a Chaos Warp targeting Corvold, putting it back into the command zone. What? Hi guys, Griffin here. Just wanted to let you guys know why I did cast that Chaos Warp targeting the Corvold. Now, as you can see, Corvold is now a 21-21, which would have taken out Peter as he didn't have any flying blockers. So you might be wondering, Griffin, why why did you do that? You would have taken out the opponent that has 28 snakes. Now friends, if you've played against Corvold, you know this. If you can do anything against Corvold, then you do that thing against Corvold. At this point, I was hoping to drop a mountain on my turn to cast my commander, forcing my opponents to attack each other, and I was hoping that 28 snakes could have taken out my both of my opponents, so I kind of needed Peter there. So that's the reasoning behind why Chaos Warped the Corvold keeping Peter in the game. Much to Lannan's dismay. The Chaos Warp will trigger Griffin's young Pyromancer and he will make an Elemental. Landon goes to discard, discarding a crap ton of cards to hand size including an Avenger of Zendikar. On his end step, Caleb's Keeper of the Accord will trigger and he will put a basic planes onto his board. Unfortunately, in all the hustle and bustle of that wacky turn, we did forget to do the last part of Chaos Warp, which was shuffle and reveal a card from the top. And if it's a permanent, it goes into play. We forgot to do that. Um, sorry, this this game was kind of hectic. There are some triggers that we missed and we were just like trying our very best to like keep track of the triggers in their orders. So some were missed. Griffin untaps and draws, and the puzzle box will trigger, and he will put six cards from his hand on the bottom and draw six more, giving Peter six more snakes. 
He plays a mountain as his land for turn and then taps four mana to cast Carter, his commander, and putting a goat effect on all of his opponent's creatures, meaning they have to attack and they cannot attack Griffin. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and puts eight cards from his hand on the bottom of his library and draws eight more from Teferi's puzzle box. He plays down a Mossfire Valley as his land for turn and then taps five mana for a Zealous Conscripts, stealing Griffin's Carter until the end of turn. He goes to combat and having to swing with everything, swings 20 snakes and Zealous Conscripts and Zyrus at Landon and 17 snakes and Carter at Caleb. Caleb blocks Carter with Drina and a snake with Keeper of the Accord and Landon blocks a snake with his Mayhem Devil. They all take the remaining damage resulting in two snakes and Carter dying. Three Carter triggers will resolve after three creatures dying in combat, gaining Peter three life and draining everybody else for three. Zyrus will then trigger, having dealt 3 damage to Landon, resulting in Landon and Peter both drawing 3 more cards and giving Peter 3 more snakes. He then passes the turn, going to discard, and the Keeper of the Cord will trigger since Caleb has less creatures than Peter and Caleb will make a 1-1 soldier. Caleb then goes to his turn and untaps and in his upkeep, Bitter Blossom triggers giving him a Fairy Rogue and Dark Confidant will trigger, revealing a Read the Bones off the top and Caleb will lose a total of 4 life for those 2 effects. He then draws and then the puzzle box will trigger and he will put seven cards on the bottom of his library and draw seven new ones, giving Peter seven more snakes. Caleb then plays down a Westvale Abbey as his land for turn and pays two mana to cast a Zulaport Cutthroat. He pays two more mana for a Bastion of Remembrance and makes a human soldier token when it enters the battlefield. He goes to combat having to swing from the Carter Goat ability and swings Dark Confident, Keeper of the Accord and a human soldier at Peter. Peter blocks four snakes to the keeper and one snake to each of the other two, letting them all trade and go to the graveyard. This will trigger Caleb's Bastion and Zulaport Cutthroat, dealing six damage to each of his opponents, and Caleb is going to gain six life. He finishes off his turn by main phasing an anguished unmaking to destroy the puzzle box and lose three life. He then passes the turn to Landon. Oh boy. Landon begins his turn by untapping and drawing. He starts by casting a Kenrith's Transformation on Caleb's Zulaport Cutthroat drawing him a card and giving Peter a snake. He then pays two mana for a Zulaport Cutthroat of his own and pays one mana for an Elvish Mystic. He sacrifices it immediately to the Viscera Seer, triggering the Zulaport Cutthroat and the Mayhem Devil. Each opponent is going to get drained for one and the Young Pyromancer will take the brunt of the Mayhem Devil damage trigger killing the Young Pyromancer. He then plays down a Swamp as his land for turn, which will give him another 2-2 zombie from the Field of the Dead. He sacrifices that zombie to the Viscera Seer, triggering the Zulaport Cutthroat and the Mayhem Devil again, sending the extra damage right to Peter's face. He then pays 7 mana to recast his commander, sacrificing the Mayhem Devil to its Enter the Battlefield trigger. This will trigger the Zulaport Cutthroat and the Mayhem Devil and Corvold. Each opponent is going to be drained for 1, gaining Landon a life, and Peter will take the extra damage from the Mayhem Devil. Landon will draw a card, and Peter will make a snake with Zyrus. He then taps out the rest of his mana to cast a Crux of Fate, choosing to destroy all non-dragon creatures. In response to this and holding priority, he sacrifices his own Zulaport Cutthroat and Viscera Seer to Viscera Seer, triggering Corvold two more times, drawing him two more cards, and draining everybody else at the table two more times and gaining two more life. And the Crux of Fate will finally resolve, destroying all creatures except for Corvold. Caleb's Bastion of Remembrance triggers having three of his creatures die, and his opponents will be drained for three, and Caleb will gain three life. After that, Landon heads to his end step, discarding to hand size. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a mountain as his land for turn and taps out to cast Rally the Horde. He exiles the top three cards of his library, gets one non-land card in the middle, but the final card exiled is a land so he doesn't get to repeat the process, so in the end he is left with one warrior token for six mana. Have you ever spent six mana for a 1-1? One, one? Griffin has. <laughs> Tapped out and a bit bummed out, Griffin passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and taps 3 mana including a green to cast a crop rotation with 2 mana floating. He sacrifices his tap scavenger grounds, leaving a red and a colorless floating, finds a rejuvenating springs and puts it into play untapped. He uses the rest of his mana and taps 1 more to cast a goblin sharpshooter. He then taps the rest of his mana to cast a spiteful prankster. He equips the goblin sharpshooter with the lightning greaves to give it haste and then passes the turn with no further actions. Caleb untaps and gets a Fairy Rogue token in his upkeep and draws. He then plays a High Market as his land for turn and taps 6 mana to recast Jarena Kudro, making 2 more human soldier tokens when they enter the battlefield. 
He then taps all but the high market to cast a luminous brood moth, taking two damage from his ancient tomb, and with nothing left, passes the turn to Landon. <laughs> Landon heads into the fateful turn number eight and untaps and draws. He plays down a woodland cemetery as his land for turn, triggering his filth of the dead for a brand new fresh 2-2 zombie creature token. He pays three mana to cast Yeheni Undying Partisan and then taps four mana for a blood for bones. When that spell resolves, he sacrifices a zombie to the blood for bones ability and this will trigger Corville drawing him a card and will trigger Peter's spiteful prankster dealing a damage to Caleb. The blood for bones will put Avenger of Zendikar into play and put Zulaport Cutthroat back into Landon's hand. When the Avenger of Zendikar enters the battlefield it's going to make 15 one plant tokens because Landon has 15 lands in play. He then taps a soul ring for two and uses a black to cast Zulaport Cutthroat and then pays three more mana to cast a victimize targeting the mayhem devil and viscerous seer in his graveyard which will return if the spell resolves. While it is on the stack, Peter responds by tapping his goblin sharpshooter to deal one damage to Landon. Caleb responds to this activation by tapping his own high market to sacrifice Jarena. When Jarena dies, a bunch of death triggers are going to go on the stack in active player, non-active player order, meaning Peter's will resolve last and Caleb's will resolve first. Spiteful Prankster and Goblin Sharpshooter go on the stack and then Bastion of Remembrance and Luminous Broodmoth trigger. The Bastion of Remembrance then triggers, draining each of Caleb's opponents for one. Peter chooses to target Landon with the Spiteful Prankster and chooses to resolve the Goblin Sharpshooter untapped trigger first. The sharpshooter untaps and in response to the spiteful prankster trigger before that damage is dealt to Landon, he taps the sharpshooter to deal one damage to Caleb. The spiteful prankster trigger then resolves dealing Landon one point of damage, taking Landon down to zero life and knocking him out of the game. High market then finally resolves and Caleb will gain one life. And since Landon is out of the game, the rest of Landon's triggers on the stack will fizzle completely out and the turn will go to Griffin. Rip in peace, Landon. What a mess that turn was. This just shows the, the craziness that is Aristocrats. If that turn was confusing to you guys, trust me, it was just as confusing for us. Finding the the correct order, the player order, and the way that the stack works was never more relevant than in this game. To just give a quick recap of how it works, Lannan did say it during the turn, but it goes in active player, non-active player order. And specifically with triggers that go on the stack, they'll all go on in active player, non-active player order, with the last player in turn order having those resolved first, which means Lennon had no chance to be able to respond to them because he was not the last player to, to resolve his triggers. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a mountain as his land for turn, and then taps six mana to recast his commander, Carter. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn and then taps 5 mana to cast Eldrazi Monument, giving all of his creatures flying and indestructible, and a power buff to boot. He heads into combat being forced to swing from Carter, so he swings Spiteful Prankster and Goblin Sharpshooter at Caleb. Caleb elects not to block, taking all of it going down to 3 life. Peter then passes the turn back to Caleb. So for Caleb's turn, a very, very, very similar situation happens as what happened to Landon. There are a bunch of death triggers that go on the stack, and due to the active, non-active player ordering rule, Caleb's triggers are going to resolve last as they were the first triggers to go on the stack, and since the stack resolves from top to bottom, whatever the last triggers on the stack are will actually resolve first. So Caleb is going to untap and take a damage from the Bitter Blossom, giving him another Fairy Rogue, and he's going to draw a card. He plays down a Luxury Suite as his land for turn and heads straight into combat. He is forced to swing the four Able Tokens, a Fairy Rogue, Jarena, and Luminous Broodmoth all at Peter. Peter responds to the declared attacks by casting an Artifact Mutation on his own Eldrazi Monument, destroying it and making five Sapling Tokens as part of the spell's ability. Peter then declares four saplings as blocks to block the four tokens swinging at him. Caleb responds by activating his Westville Abbey to sacrifice his four tokens and his fairy rogue that's not attacking. Death triggers go onto the stack simultaneously with Caleb's five Bastion of Remembrance and Luminous Broodmoth triggers going on the stack first. Then there are four triggers from Carter seeing creatures dying in combat and four attacking creatures dying. And finally, Peter's five Spiteful Prankster and Goblin Sharpshooter triggers will go on the stack last meaning that they will resolve first. 
Peter targets Griffin with three of the spiteful prankster triggers and Caleb with the other two. He then orders the triggers such that all of his goblin sharpshooter triggers will resolve first before his spiteful prankster triggers. The sharpshooter trigger resolves, untapping it, and in response to the next one, Peter taps it to deal one damage to Griffin. He repeats this process four more times, untapping and dealing damage to Griffin with the sharpshooter, leaving him tapped out in the end. The spiteful prankster triggers resolve, targeting Griffin, dealing three more damage to him. And before the prankster triggers hit Caleb, Caleb responds by tapping his high market to sacrifice his remaining attacking fairy rogue token. More death triggers go on the stack with Bastion of Remembrance and Luminous Broodmoth first, then Carter, then Spiteful Prankster, and then Sharpshooter. Peter targets Griffin with the Spiteful Prankster, but resolves the Sharpshooter first, untapping and then tapping in response to deal one more damage to Caleb. Those triggers both resolve, and then Carter's triggers resolve, draining each of Griffin's opponents for one, taking Caleb out of the game, exiling the rest of Caleb's triggers on the stack. But Griffin's other Carter triggers still happen, draining Peter for four. With Caleb dying, Griffin then starts his turn. Rip in peace, Caleb. Another hectic turn with a lot of triggers on the stack. Going off a lot of aristocrats' deaths. Complete, absolute chaos during these turns. And it's really hard to tell where you're going to end up. So always remember to watch those triggers in what order that you are resolving them in. Because it may end up that you won't be able to get out of it alive. Griffin starts turn number 9, untapping and drawing, and plays on a mountain as his land for turn. He then pays 3 mana to cast a Phyrexian Arena, and pays 4 more mana for a Pitiless Plunderer. And with nothing left, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and heads straight into combat. He swings 5 Sapperlings and his Spiteful Prankster at Griffin. Griffin blocks 3 of the Sapperlings with 3 of his creatures and takes the rest of the damage, which is a total of 5. The 3 Sapperlings and Griffin's Warrior will die and triggers will go on the stack starting with Peter's, so 4 Spiteful Prankster and four Goblin Sharpshooter triggers are put onto the stack. Then, three Carter triggers are put on the stack and will resolve first, draining three from Peter, which is enough to finish him off, and Griffin will stand as the victor. What a massively crazy wild game. I gotta say, um, if you're looking at this game and thinking, Griffin really didn't deserve that, well, my friends, you're absolutely right. Well, that is the chaos that you get in an Aristocrats game. Or literally, what matters is the order that you're resolving the triggers in. <laughs> yeah, that's... It hurt our brains to try and get that all figured out. I've played my Corval deck a bunch of times, and it usually never comes up because usually I'm the only Aristocrats uh, deck at the table. So, like, usually there aren't a lot of other death triggers going on the stack that are relevant. So, kind of threw me through a loop. Before we get to the play of the game and the most important cards, we want to add a new section to these gameplay videos, or to add in some commentary from our, our players. So Caleb uh, added to this game writing, I started out with an absolutely killer hand, including the most important card in my deck, Ashnod's Altar. I was feeling really good about it until it really hit me that Peter was still, of course, going to be playing Wheels. After losing my altar to Teferi's Puzzle Box, I was really just trying to get as much value and as many creatures out as possible to try and hold on with life gain. It was a crazy game, and I hope I never play another game with four Aristocrats decks again. I I, uh, I completely agree, Caleb. Peter's closing thoughts on his deck is, Zyrus and Corvold is a matchup I never want to see again. The sheer amount of card draw fueling the Zyrus deck means that every time Corvold goes on another sacrificing spree, there are just so many snakes to keep track of, and either Corvold is going to be stopped, and then it's just going to be a board full of snakes, or Corvold is going to win on that turn. Not saying that that's how it's going to be every single time, but I can say that these two commanders in particular feed off of each other incredibly well. Having multiple aristocrat decks literally made my brain so overloaded I couldn't do anything else for the rest of the day, and the last turn where I swung out at Griffin was my biggest mistake, and also the move that I thought the least about because I literally could not think at that point. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, I completely agree with that too, Peter. I think that's one of the reasons why I was able to pull out on top, just because my brain wasn't so overloaded by all the triggers going on, even though we did literally spend like an hour trying to resolve all these things in the right order and make sure we weren't messing up. But uh, I was able to think, oh, maybe I, I shouldn't be the first player putting triggers on the stack because then I will lose. So Peter just couldn't couldn't think of that after all the triggers that were happening throughout the game his brain was fizzled yeah. at that point <laughs> oh griffin here i think my thoughts are pretty similar to both caleb's and peter's as i i don't really ever want to play an aristocrats a four-player aristocrats deck uh or 
a four-player aristocrats game again there are so many triggers that go on the stack it's very confusing and it can take absolutely forever to make sure that you're resolving those triggers right otherwise it just doesn't feel good you just don't know who actually wins and it at one point it did feel like it was easier to just give up and not do this <laughs> all all the decks were a lot of fun to play against though and, and all did exactly the things that they wanted to do so a, a very good aristocrats game that we wanted to do landon here um, overall, I'm actually pretty satisfied with how my Corval deck performed. I tweaked the deck a bunch before we played, and I added in way more mana ramping sources on creatures. Before in the deck, I had a bunch of like Haro, not Haro, I had a bunch of like Cultivate and Kadama's Reaches, and I just kind of felt like if there was a creature that could ramp me, it would just be better because I could sacrifice it to Corval. And I really feel like I was able to hit my bullet points, which was to set up token fodder and sacrifice outlets cast Corvold and find Avenger of Zendikar. I did all three of that. Unfortunately, I was just in the wrong spot on turn order and I got wrecked on the stack. I'm actually on a t-shirt, wrecked on the stack. Yeah, wrecked <laughs> on the stack. The stack moves for no man. Now let's move into what we feel was the play of the game and the MVP card of the game. Griffin, start us off. What are your thoughts for each of those? Oh my gosh, there were so many cards that made such a big difference in this game. It's really hard to tell. I think, honestly, the, the, the play of the game is going to be when Peter uh, put out the Spiteful Prankster and the Goblin Sharpshooter. The The only reason go Peter was able to, to stand out on top killing Landon and Caleb was just because he had two triggers, um, two Aristocrats triggers that were going to go off instead of just one, which both Landon and Caleb only had one. So he's able to come out on top there, removing two players. Uh, so that was massively important. I think that was definitely the play of the game. As far as the most important part of the game, I'm actually not to be conceded here, but Cardor forcing all the opponents to attack each other, that made a massive difference in the game, forcing a lot of decisions that weren't going to be made. I don't think Peter was necessarily planning to attack with his snakes. I think he was more planning to reserve them and hold them off until he could use some sort of aristocrat strategy to, to deal with them, like the Goblin Sharpshooter. What about you, Lana? What are your thoughts? I agree with you. I think you really did hit it on the head, but for the sake of variance, I think the play of the game was probably you exiling Corvold with the Chaos Warp. Had I killed Peter, I think that would have been a much different game. I still think you might have come out on top, but I think Caleb would have had a bigger chance. I think Caleb probably suffered the most from the Carter trigger. It, like That's how I see it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say that that was the play of the game and the MVP card of the game I've got to say is Teferi's Puzzle Box. That card really did impact the game negatively a lot for Peter's opponents and Peter was getting so many snakes off of us and I think that that card just did so much for Peter. It stuck around for so long. He got so much value out of that. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. I, I honestly uh, forgot because it took so long to read this that I had Chaos Swap Corvold at the beginning of the game. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think that changed the whole trajectory because uh, I, I might have I might have been able to come back. Um, oh, absolutely, you would have. You you were set. You were poised to win twice. Was the thing. Yeah. Um, Corvold, yeah. you you uh, wiped the board, and in the next turn, you built it up even bigger than you had when you wiped it. So I think Corvold is the most powerful deck in being able to just absolutely restore your board to an even better state than it was. And even if I would have waited and chaos warped. Uh, Corvold after you had killed Peter I couldn't have, have caught up because once it's just you and I Carter doesn't do anything and I was hoping for Carter to be able to navigate my opponents away from me uh, but that wasn't going to be possible against just a one-on-one -on -one with Corvold yeah that's that's totally fair yeah I agree with that so all right friends I hope you enjoyed this game of aristocrats we did have a lot of fun playing this even though it was kind of a pain to get the triggers but a very fun experience if you want to be able to participate in our next Patreon Decided Gameplay and decide what we are going to play on these games, head on over to patreon.com slash commandvalley. Join today, get access to exclusive perks like our polls, join us in our gameplays that we play over Discord with each other and our patrons, and just a lot of other cool stuff. Another reminder, if you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel, like this video, comment what you liked about this video, which deck you like the most, and make sure to check out all of our other awesome content, including all the new Caltime deck hacks that are coming out every single week. I'd also like to just thank all of our patrons and all of our subscribers and everybody that watches all of our deck techs and our gameplay videos. We really couldn't do this without you guys. 
We really appreciate your support. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we look forward to making more content for you guys. And with that, we hope that you guys have an amazing week. See you later, goats. And may you never play a four-player aristocrats deck. Never, ever. <laughs> Just do not. Please. <laughs>